and moored in a delightfully peaceful corner under some willows, where the swans dipped their necks gracefully in search of food, and the trees and hedges looked down at their own reflections in the water. At Bullsbridge Junction I drew my windlass, a curious piece of crooked iron, which I was told was the golden key which would open the locks of the Grand Union Canal and take the Mary Ann over the Chiltern Hills, past Watford and Berkhamsted, and into the heart of England. The Grand Union is really an amalgamation of no less than nine different waterways, and with its various branches, it covers altogether around about 300 miles of canal. Most of it was built towards the end of the 18th century, and it's still carrying industrial goods and pleasure boats all around the south and east of England. The boatmen work pretty long hours, sometimes right into the night, though as Mr. Rance points out, they don't enjoy that very much. During the bad nights, the windy, rough nights, the boat people, they're very brave, but they do hate travelling at night, unless they're well away in the country. Going through towns, they do not like travelling at night. Because of these uh, so-called teddy boys on the towpath, interfering with the boats if they tie up, and if uh, one of the daughters go in front to get the locks ready, they're ready to trip her up, and we've had quite a bit of that just lately. Well, that was Mr. Rance, who's a painter and lives in a small cottage beside the canal at Berkhamsted. He's worked for many years on the canals. Well, there are 44 locks between Cowley and Cowrow's summit, and each one only raises the boat about six feet, so they're pretty hard work. Still, one gets accustomed to them after a time. I soon find I had a nice little collection of blisters on the palms of my hands. The canal ran on through a delectable wooded countryside beyond Rickmansworth, a land where the air was filled with the murmur of wood pigeons and an occasional startled pheasant shot away through the undergrowth like a winged explosion. As I came on towards Berkhamsted, the canal rose sometimes on embankments over the surrounding countryside, which gave me a pleasant view and I saw fields of watercress, which I thought were grown from the canal water. But uh, I later met Mr. Sharp, who told me I was wrong about that. I wondered how long watercress had been grown around Berkhamsted. Well, they've been in existence a hundred years, I should think. My family's been here for three generations, and the third generation. Of course, watercress can only be grown in the correct areas, the uh, areas where you can get uh, artesian bores or artesian springs because of the water having to be a warm temperature in the winter, 52 degrees throughout the year, which uh, protects the plant from the frost. Uh, the river Bourbon is only really used uh, for uh, taking the water away, uh, whereas m most people have the impression it's grown in uh, river water, but I would like to uh, <laughs> emphasize it is grown in the pure artesian water. We've had a lot of trouble with the crook root disease, which is a new disease that's come out since the war. We've got, um, there's been a lot of trouble all over the country. It's a disease caused by a sort of fungus, which suddenly appeared just after the last war. There was nothing at all of this before the war, and the um, scientists have been working on it for about 10 years now. It's completely um, a mystery, really, because, I mean, the scientists can't uh, tell us where it comes from. It's one of those things like the, the musk that lost its smell on a certain date in, early in the century. I had enough trouble getting watercress in London. You can get it, I suppose, often enough, but it's not very good sometimes. So I asked Mr. Sharp where he sold his cress. Most of the stuff goes um, north and Midlands. A certain amount goes to the to London, which was our traditional market, but there's been so many uh, more recent uh, growers uh, starting up in the south that have really coloured our London market, so we have to go to the north now. These people work in water all the time, and I wondered what it was like there in the winter. 
It's uh, cold, of course, in the winter. The main um, thing that uh, causes discomfort is the wind. Actually, uh, if you've got wet hands in the biting wind, you're liable to get to cracks. The canal runs fairly straight on past Berkhamstead, with high woods rising on the right-hand side. Every canal has a summit. That's to say, like mountains, they have highest points from which the water falls away, but the locks are filled and emptied. I wondered what I'd find at Karost as I worked my way on. Even with my wildest guesses, I didn't come near what I did, in fact, find right beside the canal. A vast collection of wooden aeroplane propellers. I wanted to know more about them. I met Mr. O'Neill there, who was quite prepared to tell me. So what are those hundreds of propellers lying by the canal? Uh, those are Barracudas and Spitfires, which were declared obsolete uh, after the war. And we bought in 10,000 of them. We just bought in um, about three quarters of a million pieces of weapon equipment, uh, which we're hoping to export to uh, some foreign country. Uh, probably Algeria, where they're going on, or something like that. Uh, we got a hundred tons of uh, Dannet barbed wire we used in the forces for fencing in and um, uh, trenches and etc. That will probably go out. In fact, we have an inquiry already from Nairobi for that. The place was crammed with cars of every kind and description. The chaos of cars. I wondered how they'd got there. The cars were more as a sideline. Um, I started years ago as a hobby, and I did a bit of racing and building of cars for special events, and I collected so many around me, I gradually started selling a few parts and showed a profit, so I carried on. Matter of fact, I think I showed more profit in those days than I do now when I carried some extensive stock. <laughs> what are those? Those bayonets I saw outside? Yes, yeah, they're bayonet scabbards, actually. There's 160,000 of those. What do you intend to do with those? Hope that somebody will come along and buy them for scrap. The metal in them? No, the, the, the leather. There's, there's beautiful leather in them, of course. You know, the, I don't know what they actually use them for. Mending shoes, perhaps. To return to the propellers a minute, what do you intend to do with them? Oh, I keep them in my own personal use, actually. Uh, I found a wonderful fuel. You've got a terrific heat in them, having a, a hydrogen content uh, and laminated beech. And um, I haven't used any coal for six years. They burn beautifully. There's no smoke with them like that. They clean the chimney. There's a copper sulfate in them as well. Um, the 10,000 we had, we bought from Bristol and various aerodromes. Uh, most of them were new, and I think they cost them about £680 each. Uh, there was a case of BA nuts and bolts sold in Germany, and they were sold for £35, and uh, somebody in the trade bought them back to England and sold them for £8,000. They turned out to be pure silver medical nuts and bolts. Well, I see there's some telephone instruments lying there. Oh, yes, I've been here some time. Matter of fact, I bought those 1948 or 9, when it was impossible to get a telephone put on because of the shortage of instruments. And I bought thousands from the ministry, quite good. In fact, we use some in our other business. I found that the English towns are generally much more delightful when approached by water than by road. I looked up Leighton Buzzard on my map, and then went ashore there to have a glass of beer came as something of a surprise when I went into the pub to learn that I wasn't in Leighton Buzzard at all, but in Lindslade. The two towns are so close together that it may be pardonable to mistake one for the other, as Howard Wiseman points out. Leighton Buzzard is a quiet country town, except on Tuesdays. And then they have the market. Now, when I was a boy, the market spread each side of the high street. It's a fine high street at Leighton Buzzard, a big, broad high street dominated at the end by the school, the Cedar School, which is a fine old Georgian house looking straight up the street. Now, of course, they've moved the market off into a yard at the side, and it's lost half its charm, to my mind. The industries there, the main industry is sand. The silver sand of Leighton Buzzard is unique and it's sent all over the world for pottery mostly, even to Egypt. Other sand is dug there, but the silver sand is the principal thing. The interesting thing about Leighton Buzzard is that the railway station is actually in Lindslade. 
because the Bazardians in the days when the railway was built, about 1860, they didn't want the thing in Leighton Buzzard, so they stuck it a mile and a half out of the town, which hasn't helped, of course, in developing the place. There is the canal. Now, 40 years ago, the canal was an important means of transport. Stuff was brought down from Birmingham to London, and my own grandfather was for a time the foreman at the wharf yard in Linslade where the barges were brought in. The narrow boats, as we called them. They still run the narrow boats on the canal, but largely now the transport, of course, is done by rail. Holidays can be taken on the barges still from Leighton Buzzard up to Birmingham and back, and a very pleasant holiday it is too through all rural England. When I was a boy, August Bank Holiday was a carnival at Leighton Buzzard. Its roots go back to pagan days and it was bloody pagan. The people came in from the surrounding countryside, an enormous pageant was held all the way through Leighton Buzzard with decorated drays, all horse-drawn, and following that, the pubs, of course, were open all day. The pubs at Leighton Buzzard in those days, by the way, there was about one pub for every 60 of the population, so the drinking was considerable. There was very little else to do in Leighton Buzzard in those days. And on August Bank Holiday, the rivalry between Leighton Buzzard and Linslade, which are indeed an entity, but in separate counties, Bedfordshire and Bucks, separated by the Ouzel, this rivalry always finished in violence in the high street. The police used to have a very rough time those days. I'd heard some grand songs when I was up on the east coast of England but I didn't expect to find them in the heart of the country. I was wrong. T'was in the month of May When the flowers they were gay When the orange tree was all in bloom When the orange, orange, orange tree was all in the bloom and down by the river side a fair maid I espied a crying for her own true love she was lamenting sighing crying for her own true love. What makes ye sigh and cry, my fair pretty maid, said I, I'm a-crying for my own true love. She was lamenting, sighing, crying for her own true love. But now she has got wed, and all her troubles fled. She's a living with her own true love. She's a laughing, singing, playing with her own true love. When I got to Stoke Bruin, the lock keeper, John James and I, had a chat in his magnificent garden after he'd helped me up to the top of the flight. He told me about the leggers who used to get the boats through the tunnel by lying on their backs and walking them for almost two miles. They'd lay on their back and leg through, one each side, and that's how they used to get the boats through, before the steam tug was thought of. I noticed Mr. James had what you might almost call a small museum of the traditional goods and chattels which he used on the canal. It's a pity to lose this old traditional style on the canals because, you know, in the old days they was real smart. The dress, even the boatmen themselves, used to take a great pride in the way they used to dress. 
with their corduroy trousers with the bell bottoms and the velvet seams down the side and the diamond stitching around the bottom of the trousers and then they used to have their the, the wives used to make them the fancy knitted braces with the brass buckles and they used to have the silk thrums, what they used to use in the whip, go across from buckle to buckle, tied in a bow down the front of the white cotton unmade shirts with the feather red stitching all down the front. And they used to look really, well, as a matter of fact, I've worn them myself. Even my own wife used to make my shirts, you see, in those days. Oh, it was... He always is ashamed to lose this thing. But of course it's a thing, it seems to me, that it's dying out very, very fast. And there are very, very few left now on the canals who knows how to do these things. It's a pity. It's just the same with the old traditional rope work on the boats. You see, when the number ones had their boats, they used to compete one against the other. So you could get the best turnout, and they would even spend pounds at these docks to go and get their boat painted up better than to beat the other fella. And then later on, that fella, he'd say to his wife, Oh, good gracious, Sarah, did you notice Bill's boat? Doesn't it look nice? She'd say, By God, Joe, it does. Well, we'll have to see what we mustn't let him get away with that, you know. We'll see what we can do. I wonder where he's had it docked at, she'd say to him. Well, it looks to me like Polesworth painting. I think it is. But anyhow, I'm going to see what I... Oh, he's not going to get away with that. I'm going to have something to beat that, I know. And then he'd go and spend another extra five pound to have his boat painted up to beat him. Sort of thing. See, competition, one against the other. Just the same with the horses. They would see who could get the best turnout of brasses and crochet ear caps. Oh, you should have seen in those days the air caps that they used to have on their horses. And the painted nose tins, even the nose tins that they used to carry to feed their horse, would be painted in the old traditional style with the roses and diamonds all around and a brass buckle polished up all to match the harness. It was lovely. Now, you take the uh, rope work that they used to use. You take uh, swan's necks, uh, Turk's heads, and Turk's heads on the tillers, and the brass ferrules on the tillers. And they used to even have the brass rims fitted on the chimneys, and then knitted ropes with the brass rosettes on the chimney. Brass chimney chain coming down onto the cabin top, all polished. And this time of the year, that looks to look lovely. And then they, in the rosette, they'd have a nice piece of ribbon, blue ribbon, tied in a bow on that chimney, and all that sort of thing. And then along the boat, you see, they'd have what they call the white cotton strings, gittering strings, go along, all along the planks, all scrubbed white. And then the uh, strings, the gittering strings over the deck cratches with a nice piece of black painted canvas cloth going down from the top of the plank onto the gunwale and three cotton strings over that all nicely scrubbed and in addition to that they're on the stem of the boat they would have a nice white cotton half inch fender all oh, that would have to be scrubbed and a nice white scrubbed bag on the deck lid and all around the bows of the boat it would all be painted diamonds and all that sort of thing. Of course, you know, I was one of the old number ones in the old days. I used to have my own boats, and I used to have my own horses, and I used to have my horses decorated up with the brasses and the martingales, the swingers, and the ear caps, and the painted nose tins. Oh, I used to take a great interest in my horse in those days, you know. I used to love it, and I didn't like to let anyone else beat me. Blissworth Tunnel comes very close after Stoke Bruin. And I went into it holding the torch in one hand and the tiller in the other. And I could just see a speck of light about the size of the head of a pin getting on for two miles away at the far end. Braunston Tunnel, which followed after a pleasant stretch of canal, was almost as long 
I can't say that I enjoyed going through either of them very much, but eventually I emerged on the far side of the hills and locked down to Braunston Junction, where Michael Street runs one of the yacht hire firms for people who spend their holidays on the canals. We have managed to get hold of a small fleet of little cruisers, which we also offer for hire people who still want to explore canals but don't want to travel as guests on a hotel boat, uh, but who want to do all the uh, exploration for themselves, work their own locks, steer the boats. And we now have uh, seven of these little boats uh, for independent hire and two pairs of hotel boats carrying 12 passengers each. Uh, though it's uh, a job, it's still fun with me, and uh, I wouldn't want to go back to city life if you paid me. Our big holiday boats carrying the 12 passengers with the crew aboard providing all meals and services are cruising this year between Oxford and Braunston along the very beautiful and not very much used commercially uh, Oxford Canal and then from Braunston again up to Loughborough along an even less used and perhaps uh, one of the prettiest canals in England between Norton Junction and Leicester. Each cruise takes uh, a week and uh, costs from about 12 guineas a week up to a maximum of 18. I suppose that if you ask most people what they associated with narrow boats, they'd be most likely to answer roses and castles those graceful and romantic paintings which bring a glitter of colour to the working boats. It was good to find that one of the younger generation, Ronald Howe of Braunston, was taking the trouble to learn this difficult art. Well, canal boats, you see, are decorated inside and outside the cabin, and especially on the doors, which have a sliding hatch on, it also has fancy painting on the top. The name on the side that we always fill in the space with as much roses as possible because they don't like to see anything bare. It must be gay and bright. And generally they have a stool, a small stool, and that is completely covered with roses because roses and castles and bright colours and they're happy. You build your sky and mountains behind and then a, a block of castle in proportion to the size of the picture about half a dozen turrets or something like that, and you generally put a bridge, and then you, you put boats in the background, two small sailing boats in the background, building in with trees, and most probably you bring your water through as a, a winding river down to the bottom of your picture, showing so as it looks as though your castle's far away and your trees are very near to you. When I got to the Oxford Canal, I travelled some way down it in the hope that I might perhaps meet Mr. and Mrs. Skinner, whose mule-drawn narrowboat has been plying along it for many years past. Mr. Skinner was the last of a proud fraternity, the number ones, who not only ran their boats themselves, but also owned them. Well, Mr. and Mrs. Skinner had to retire now, and uh, we find it rather difficult to get hold of them. But eventually we learned that they were living on their boat up at Hawkesbury Junction. I met them in the pub there. These were the genuine canal people. Narrow boats drawn by a mule were rare. Where did they get their mule from? Well, we had him off, a gentleman, an old boatman, Mr. Alfred Allen, and uh, started him on our work, see, but he, he came out the army. This mule, as we had, had a very good position in the army. You could tell by the way it had been handled. And then when we come to handle it, you could tell it, it had never been messed about, see. I mean, when you've had animals all your lifetime, you know whether one's been ill-used or whether it hasn't, see. So, uh, therefore, it was a quiet, inoffensive mule, and I think that makes a lot of difference to animals. See, they're very scarce in this country. I was supposed to have me another one. My father never owned no boats. We always worked uh, ordinary uh, boats, you see, for what we call these firms, see, but we always found our own horses. Well, I was a number one, but uh, and my father was. See, we always found our own horses and boats. 
and then the boss at Oxford and where we went to found us were loading back, they were loading up with a coal from Moyerley and Wykin and Griff, Exhall and a place called Charity at Bedworth. The pub at Hawkesbury Junction struck me as being one of the cleanest I'd ever been in. You could have quite easily eaten a meal off the floor there. Tables and benches were scrubbed as white as snow. The whole place was clean, was clean as a barge cabin. And for spick and span cleanliness, I can give it no higher praise. I would blame the landlady for this excess of brightness. The landlord was himself most proud of what your city chap would have called an old, rough pub. Well, this pub has been in our family for approximately a hundred years. Outside, uh, we have uh, what's known as Hawkesbury Junction. That's the junction of the Oxford and the Coventry Canals. Um, once upon a time, the boats tied up here in large numbers. As a matter of fact, we used to stable 24 horses. Old Joe Skinner that sits there was the last man to stable a horse here. As a matter of fact, my grandfather left home when he was 12 and he took a job on the boats. He couldn't read or write. Uh, all his children have been uh, christened the wrong name, wrong spelling. They're known as Beasley and their proper name was Baisley. He was an Oxford man, but he must have done well for himself because he finished up by having four or five pair of boats on the canal, horses, he bought this place, got married, reared a large family. Surprising what you can do. The Greyhound was a wonderful pub, and everyone there wanted to tell me what it was like in the old days. Well, this public years ago used to have hams on all around, and also of a Sunday, they used to make Yorkshire pudding. And the boatmen used to stop and have Yorkshire pudding in here, and then they never wanted no dinner. Yeah, they didn't pay for it though, you know. They only paid for the beer. They used to be baking and hams on in the passage, and the fat used to drop on you when you come in, when it was a mild night. Oh, you could get your knife and cut a bit off, what the old boatmen used to do years ago. We never used to take any notice on it, because we thought it was good grub. They say there's plenty of trade for the boats on the canals these days. Indeed, far from diminishing, it seems to be increasing. The younger people, like Jack Carter, who served in a parachute regiment, don't always want to go back to life on the cut. And yet, they'll admit that they often miss that way of life. To my surprise, he compared it to a parachute jump. You drop out of the plane, and after you leave the worries of the slipstream behind you, the chute opens, and then comes the time that every parachutist lives for. That's why they keep on jumping. The breeze running through your air, and you're in paradise, suspended in space. And that free feeling that you're the king of the world. It reminds me of those wonderful spring mornings setting out from the summit on the Grand Junction. If you listen in next week, you can hear how the Mary Ann travelled on across the country, up the Shropshire Union, through Market Drayton, where Clive climbed the spire of the local church, on through the lovely Welsh Canal to Fangothlan, in the mountains of Wales, then back again and on to Chester, and eventually to Ellesmere Port near Liverpool. From there I went on to Dublin.